With that in mind, I'd like to get started by welcoming Dr. James Polcrano, our, our speaker today. Jim is an independent consultant, teacher, and business coach. His current projects include teaching in Switzerland, Russia, and other locations throughout the world. Uh, he has a research project on how corporations and universities use media rankings of executive education, today's topic, various strategy, networking, customer centricity, and innovation mandates with multinationals in Europe as well. He's worked with um, clients such as Caterpillar, Monsanto, and the International Committee for, of the Red Cross. Um, Jim formerly uh, has uh, been very involved with Unicon as the former chairman of Unicon. Uh, and formerly worked with the management team at IMD. We're delighted that Jim is leading today's session and also wanted to let you know that another author of the research paper, Jenny Stein, is also joining us today and will be um, involved with the questions and answers throughout the program as well. Jenny is an expert in executive education and professional development programs across multiple sectors including management, leadership development, education, and engineering. She has an outstanding track record in innovative program development, strategy, and university industry partnerships. Jenny previously worked uh, at MIT in professional education and also at Harvard in professional education. So with that, Jim, I'll turn it over to you, and we uh, look forward to today's pro program. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Rob. And thank you to everybody who's out there listening and watching right now. Uh, this, this report that Jenny... I and uh, Tom Cavers did became a labor of love. And so what you're going to see is we're going to do an overview here today of our, our research, but there's a lot there. You know, I'll go through the presentation, but I, I encourage you to read the report, go look at the infographic on the website, etc., because there's a lot to be learned here. Now I'm going to turn off my uh, webcam so that we don't have any problems with uh, bandwidth. So, just to get us started here, you know, this is what we're going to try and cover. You know, just go through a few things. Jenny may jump in occasionally to make sure that I'm honest and I keep this uh, clear for everybody. But a few preparatory remarks. First of all, this was sponsored by Unicon, but it was an independent research project that came from us. I mean, so anything that we've said here. It's, it's our opinion, not Unicon. Also, as many of you know, the FT was sold to, to Nikkei in Japan just before we finished the report. We don't know what that's going to mean for the future of the executive education rankings. Uh, maybe nothing, maybe nothing at all, but we don't know. And also, something that happened in early 2015 was Business Week decided to drop its biannual executive education and EMBA rankings, which makes the FT the only active executive education ranking out there today, so even more important for us. Than the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good, okay. Um, so we went into this with the idea that there had to be, we wanted to take a 360 view of the FT rankings and say, what would we learn if we did that? Now, the first part of it about how the FT rankings work, that was covered by Tom in the, in the previous webinar. But we wanted them to look at what we'll cover today is what do the rankings say about quality? Do customers actually use it? How do business schools use it and perceive it? And what do the experts, the ranking experts, have to say about the rankings? Um, research methodology we, we think was fairly rigorous. We went through market surveys and interviews. Over 700 open program participants were surveyed and several were interviewed. And then quite a few learning and development professionals were surveyed and interviewed, predominantly European, uh, and that is one of the weaknesses of our, of our research. We also talked to the schools and various experts, so 94 different schools were surveyed, majority from Unicom, plus several Equus schools, and then 14 different experts were interviewed. And then secondary research, literature review, an analysis of the data that we've got, and then deep talks with the FT about the rankings methodology. So our key findings. The customers are aware of these rankings and they do use them. So if you're thinking this is just something that we in the business school world think about, think twice. Our customers do pay attention to these. Many of the business schools are dissatisfied with the rankings. 
But at the same time, it is us, the business schools, who overwhelmingly are communicating these results to the world. So there's a dichotomy there. The experts we talked to and the research team itself felt that the rankings as they are today are not measures of quality. And they may even fail to capture you know, the, the innovations that are happening out there, or even stifle it because of the fear of dropping in rankings to do something innovative. But they can be useful. The ranking can be useful, but you have to understand what it is you're reading when you look at the rank. And finally, we believe there's quite a bit of room for improvement. And if we're going to do this, ideally, it wouldn't be the FT alone. It would be us, business schools, customers, working together with the FT to improve it. So our high-level recommendation, and there's much, much more detail later on that you can look at and in the report. But if we look at the business schools, respect the value of the rankings that your, as your customers see them. And your customers value these, at least many of them do, so you have to respect that. Secondly, use the information that's in this report to figure out what is the best or the most effective way for you as a school to participate in the rankings. And have some respect for the effort that the FT puts into it. Whether we like it or not, we accuse it of being media and they're just doing this to sell advertising space, they do put a lot of quality and professional effort into the rankings, and that should be respected. As far as our recommendations for open and custom program clients, uh, they need to be aware of the limitations of the rankings. I mean, too often they're looking at the headlines and just saying school X is number two, therefore it must be better than school Y, which is number 10. And we need to help our customers to go further than that and really understand the limitations of the rankings. And secondly, We'd ask them to engage as much as possible with the FT to make sure the rankings meet their criteria as a way of improving the rankings. Then the FT, well, we had a long list of things that we suggest they do, but overall, collaborate with the business schools and our customers to build a new and better ranking system and address some of those issues of transparency, diversity, and customer value that came up continuously in our conversation. Those are our overall high-level recommendations. Well, let's go to what the market was saying about the rankings. So the vast majority of the people that we talked to and surveyed on the open program side and on the custom program side, they're aware of the rankings, well aware of the rankings. Um, the interesting was the difference between North America and Europe. Whereas if you looked at Europe, 71% are aware of it, very aware of the FT rankings. Whereas in the United States and Canada, it was only 33%. Presumably, but we don't know for sure, this is simply due to the FT's publicity in Europe. It's, it's better known here than it would be in North America. So but you know, that's something that any of us have to take into account when we're communicating the rankings as to how well our clients actually understand and know about it. And the same thing on the other side as far as L&D professionals. You know, they are aware more aware in Europe than they are in the United States, 84% compared to 53%, um, but they are aware. Interesting was to see that there's still 6% of learning and development professionals in Europe and 23% in, in the United States and Canada who aren't aware of it. I, I just wonder how that happens, that they could be unaware of it when there's so much around the FT, mainly communicated by us, the business school. The majority of the stakeholders involved, whether it's our customers, us, et cetera, find value in the rankings, at least moderately valuable. Interesting, though, was that we as business school value the rankings much less than our clients. Um, th there's something going on there when we, you know, we're the ones out there communicating these rankings, and yet we don't value them as much as our clients do. A subset of that is looking at where the clients found value. And then, I mean, this is an obvious thing, but it's good to have data. They, they most value the rankings with schools that they did not know. So whether it was looking into a different area, a different region, or if somebody was new to the, to the to business, that's where the rankings had particular value for our clients. Going further, um, many of the open program participants use the rankings, again, especially in Europe. Uh, 45% of open program uh, participants 
check the rankings before attending a program, but it's not a major factor in the decision. They had 55% had already chosen the school before they went to check where it was. 24% did use the list to find a school, so they, they had a need and they were looking for a school. And then 18% used it when they were trying to get approval, budget approval, et cetera, in their organization to say, okay, send me to this school because it's ranked highly or it's ranked high in this particular criteria. And we even had one of our L&D people saying, I use it to explain to my purchasing department why I'm using this expensive school. So talking about the L&D customers who, at least from the way they talked about the rankings, fairly sophisticated users. Now they place importance on the rankings, but you know part of it is about whether the school is in the top 10 or not. Some of it is about the changes in position, but all of them stress that it was not core to their decision. You know, they, they, they do it maybe to cross check, to check if it's a, a region that they don't know well, but it isn't going to be the major thing that decides whether they use the school or not. Unless they are, for example, looking at a new region, then it becomes much more important. They have different kinds of uses for it. It could be the starting point of search. You know, the CEO or the C-suite gives you a new mandate, says, okay, we need a program that does X. And you might use the, the L&D uh, leader, learning and development person might say, okay, where do I start? Also, it could be an educational resource for somebody who's new to the industry. Uh, the quote here, you know, when I moved from strategic consulting to executive education, I was completely lost. And, you know, had the FT sitting on his desk the whole time as he was learning our industry. Others, like I mentioned earlier, you know, using it as to support the decision, even to convince procurement why you want to use it. And then finally, as I've already mentioned, a guide to markets that you don't know very well. Which are the schools that are strong in that market? Now moving on to the schools and the, the expert opinion. Not all the schools participate. 51 of the 94 schools that we surveyed participated in the FT rankings. Uh, those who did not, 55% chose not to. They, they made a decision not to participate. Another 29% just had never been there. And 14% were in there previously but dropped out. Um, for some, it was a question of feeling like, the rankings don't actually help us. You know, we are a boutique operation or a niche operation, and it doesn't really make sense for us. Or another who said, you know, listen, our students just don't care. Uh, this is not what they, they look for in making a decision with us. So, or the business model just doesn't fit with the traditional, as they view it, the traditional business model that the FT is uh, trying to evaluate. The rankings seem to be of greatest importance to European schools. Now, I mean, and the numbers are, are fairly remarkable on this. You know, a big difference between Europe and North America, but 67% compared to 17%. Now, why is this? My assumption is that this goes back to the roots of the FT kicking off its uh, rankings many years, 16 years ago. And that European schools wanted to be noticed, not be overshadowed by their the North American cousins. And I suspect that's still something that the European schools have held on to, is that if we do well in the rankings, we'll be noticed by the world. Other, other schools, for example, Latin America, don't consider it important because nobody reads the FT there. So you know, it's important to different schools for different reasons. Satisfaction amongst the school is mixed. If one's a cynic, you could say, you know, you're only happy with the rankings when you go up in the rankings, you're high in the rankings. But in any case, there were, there were no schools that were completely satisfied or extremely satisfied. And in the open program, it was greater than 40% that were not at all, <clears throat> or only slightly uh, satisfied. But it is an important marketing tool. You know, for some schools, it's a way of standing out in the region. Uh, you know, several of them, said, several schools said, you know, we, we put the FT ranking into every piece of collateral that we've got because um, we know that it's our way of standing out from other schools in our region or in our particular area of the world. Um, and it's a way of differentiating, which goes back to that question of who communicates the rankings. 
The FT does, but we as the business schools do it far more than they do. The schools communicate it broadly. It's nice to see that 76% of them are sharing it with their internal stakeholders, such as faculty. But the interesting thing was that there's still 18% that don't share it at all. Now, is that because they didn't do well in the rankings? It's better just not to talk about it. But in any case, you know, it's, it's up to us to figure out what's the best way to use the ranking, wherever it is we are in the ranking. There are different views on how much position makes, you know, how important it is. For some, it was probably just a question of if you're in the top 10, that's great. Um, but we found some schools saying that they chose not to participate because, you know, if you're not in the top 20, that looks bad. So better not to take that risk. But for other schools, you know, just being in the rankings at all is a chance to say, we are in the rankings, thus we are world class. So for some, and I guess it depends on where you are or your top tier school where going from being number six to number eight is a disaster, or are you in other schools that say, listen, you know, we're the top 100 in the world, and that is already something really valuable. Now, this is something that we debated a lot in the, in the research team about whether the rankings actually show quality. And it was interesting to see that you know, out of all the schools that we talked to and surveyed, over half of them had made programmatic changes based on the FT's executive education ranking. So, but when we went deeper and started looking at that and asking in interviews what kind of changes they've made, they said, we do use it as customer feedback. And we do constantly evaluate the FT data to see do we need to change things? You know, you know, is our quality as good as we should? But all said, you know, it's not something where you make a change solely based on the FT ranking. It, it's one piece of data to help you decide if you need to make some changes. Some data points on, on the school's process, and I think the one of the most important ones for me is the amount of time that schools put into this. You know, the vast majority of schools are putting in five or more days into the effort for the FT ranking. So this is not an insubstantial thing. If you're going to participate seriously in the rankings, it's going to take time. And you have to decide whether it's worth it or not for you. Uh, an interesting point that I don't understand is that on the, if you look on the not that difficult, certainly getting the data from our custom program contacts, from our open program of clients, seems to be relatively easy. But the institutional data was the hardest stuff to gather, so the internal stuff. And I wonder what that says to us about the information sharing within our own schools. And then the last point about schools gathering data themselves, the uh, vast majority have a great CRM system of some sort, so they have their client data, their participant data. Uh, only two schools that we talked to actually query their participants about rankings in the survey, so only a few actually know how do participants view the rankings. And they don't use the rankings or discussions about the rankings with their participants in market research. And that seemed like a gap that some schools should take advantage of. Jim, it looks like we do have a quick question from the audience sure. wondering, with the FT having been purchased by Nikkei, do you think the survey will become less European focused? I mean, I could, I could see that as a natural thing that should happen. I mean, one of the things we discussed in the team was, you know, should we have put more effort into trying to learn more about how the Chinese schools or the Asian schools are coming along? Um, you know, if I was Nikkei, I would push on that side. And that's not just because of Nikkei being in Japan, but because of the impact that we believe Chinese schools and Chinese companies are going to have. So I don't have any data that says that's going to happen. Uh, we haven't been told by the FT or anybody else that that will happen, but to me, that seems like an obvious thing that should happen. Okay. So when we when we asked schools about you know what they liked, didn't like, what they would criticize, there as you could imagine, there were quite a few comments. And if we kind of put these into a couple of buckets, one criticism that we heard over and over again was that the FT rankings, as they are today, they were the big traditional schools, the Harvards, the Wharton's, et cetera, of the world. 
you know, the, the, the model of the big U.S. business school. Another big critique was about the lack of transparency. You know, we, we all respond to these surveys, we send the surveys out, and yet we really don't know what happens to the data. It's, it's a black box. And then the third criticism was on the survey instrument itself, that times have changed, there have been improvements in how we do surveys, but there should be some improvement there. And, and we're going to detail in this further along, but you know, one of the things that stood out overall was that you know, we talk about the open programs being surveyed, and we're all asked to put forward two to four schools for the uh, programs for this, but then that goes into a ranking of the school. Shouldn't it just be called the AMP, GMP rankings rather than the open program rankings? Is it really is it representative of open programs as a whole within a school? But I mean, these are these are many of the things that we thought need to be worked on. There were a lot of ideas coming from the schools about how to update the rankings as well. You know, perhaps we should have rankings within various areas, strategy, leadership, innovation. Make the scaling simpler. And perhaps, you know, rather than having a one through whatever, a hundred ranking, put schools into bands. Because we know the statistical difference between a school that's, you know, fourth and a school that's eighth is insignificant. So put people, schools, top tier, middle schools, et cetera. But try to make it so that it is something statistically different. And maybe have some rankings so we can compare similar programs. So we know that we're comparing apples to apples and not apples to pears. The ranking experts that we talked to had quite a few concerns, and they seem to mirror the concerns that we and the schools had. So that question about whether this is really a quality metric or not, it's a reputation metric. So, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with a reputation metric, but our customers need to understand that that's what they're looking at. Secondly, this question of transparency. You know, it is black. We, as researchers, could not even see the survey instrument. The FT keeps that secret. Why? We're not 100% sure, but it would seem in this day and age of open source everything that this should be something out there. And then the third question was on whether the rankings are actually stifling innovation in our industry. Because, you know, if you're doing well in rankings, do you really want to take the risk of introducing a huge innovation into one of the programs that's going to be ranked afterwards? I mean, no. You'd rather do it in something else or let the small schools do it when, or the unranked schools. And then when they prove that an innovation works, then take it off. But is that good for our industry? So, Trying to, in a sense, summarize what we learned through all this, we saw what we call challenges and disconnects that we think need to be addressed. And again, we tried to simplify the world by putting them into three buckets of relevance, methodology, and credibility. So could we somehow improve the rankings so they have greater and wider relevance within our industry? You know, the rankings were created back in 98, 99, and a lot has happened since then. For those of us who have been in the industry for that long, we know that our industry has changed. And so it's a very, I think, relevant question to ask, how should the, the rankings, criteria, methodologies that are changed to keep up with that? Secondly, are the longer programs, longer here I'm saying, more than three days, is that the right thing for EFT to be measuring? and they're trying to figure out the quality of school. I mean, many of us back in the late 90s still had long programs, 10 weeks, 8 weeks, 6 weeks. Very few of us have those today. And shorter courses are becoming the major, major, major trend. That's what's being asked for by our clients. And yet we're still measuring programs and insisting that they're longer as far as the measurement. The question about whether there's too much bias to international schools. Now, to be fair to the FT, They've said since the very beginning that this is an international ranking. So, you know, it's not their fault that, you know, there's this quite bias towards international schools. But maybe there's room for national rankings or regional rankings that would help domestic or national companies or clients choose a better school to suit them rather than always looking up to the big international schools, which may or may not fulfill their needs. 
And the question about whether some smaller schools are being kept out or some new schools are being kept out because of the requirement of accreditation and the $2 million cutoff as far as revenue. You know, should there be some more flexibility on this to allow new schools in, especially new schools perhaps coming from Asia? The methodology itself, there were quite a few comments and criticisms of this, uh, the so-called bullwhip effect. And, and I'm sure that anybody who's observed the rankings over the years has seen this. You know, school that was, I don't know, number eight one year is suddenly, suddenly number 16. Their school that was 33 is now 14. Is that really possible? I mean, we know that as much as we want to make change happen in our schools, we don't change that quickly over one year. So there's something going on here that's not quite right. And we need to help the FT and work with the FT to find a stronger methodology to avoid this. Such as, you know, the question of the 10-point scale. You think about it, you're asking open program participants to qualify the school that they just went to that they now carry that brand. And you give them a 10 point scale. And for the most part, they're gonna grade it eight, nine, or 10. So it's actually a three point scale. So not really as rigorous as we'd like as far as finding you know, value in the ranking. On the weighting side, especially for custom programs, maybe we need to be asking the companies what they consider to be important before signing weighting, or maybe make the rankings a dynamic vehicle where you know somebody who wants to can assign the weighting that they think is important online to find out which uh, ranking makes sense. And then the sampling question. I mean, it would be great if we were if the FT was able to get more custom program uh, data, but there are issues in getting uh, customers to respond, participants to respond, and the question about the open programs that are surveyed. I mentioned this earlier. Um, this does bias things. And what about credibility? Why doesn't the FT share more information with us? You know, they may have very good reasons for it, but because it's not shared, it causes a question of um, credibility. The questions that are asked in the surveys, uh, sometimes they're ambiguous. And, you know, that isn't helpful when you're trying to I uh, hope that the answers that you're seeing are relevant. Then the question came up about whether the FT can remain objective. On one side, this is an ongoing issue simply because the FT is about selling more newspapers, selling more advertising space. But if you add to that the, the FT, i.e. hookup that was announced late last year, there's questions about whether the FT itself is the, the honest broker now. And then the last point that was often raised is, why is there any audits of the data? The FT does audit on a regular basis schools on the FT rankings. Why not do it on the executive education rankings? So some detailed recommendations to close this out. Um, and this, we've broken this up into two parts. One is assuming the rankings stay the same, that there's not going to be major changes in it. And first talking about the schools. First thing we'd say is, first of all, decide as a school, what is our strategy for the executive education rankings? You know, do we want to participate and is it important to us? If it is, align your ranking strategy and tactics with the school's overall strategy. This is not some little thing to have on the side. Take it seriously, be proactive about it, put somebody in charge. If you don't have somebody in charge, it's not going to be done well. Figure out which of the open programs you want to have surveyed. I know this sounds like you're gaming the system, but you are gaming the system, and everybody's doing it, so do it well. Use your net promoter score or whatever data you've got to know which, which programs are going to do well in the open program rankings, and put those forward. If you want to make major innovations, and you're worried about your ranking because you're, you're high up there and you like where you are, our suggestion is that you do the innovation outside the survey programs and wait until they've proven themselves before you introduce those into the survey program. When you're talking with your participants, be explicit about what you offer as far as criteria so they recognize it when they see the survey. This is normal customer relationship management. They pay attention to your learning and development counterpart. 
and her needs so that, because that counts a lot when it comes time for them to survey you. This is not something that's going to change overnight. Even though I just talked a few seconds ago about the bullwhip of that, don't assume that doing something today will see an immediate result in the, the FT ranking. And then if, after all this discussion, you say, nope, we're going to opt out. We don't want to be part of the rankings anymore, which is fine. That is a choice. But then recognize you're going to have to find other ways to generate awareness with your target clients. And last, please share whatever metrics you're using with the FT. Yeah, how can they improve this if they don't know what we see as quality metrics and encourage your clients to do the same? Recommendations that I'd hope you would make to your open and custom program clients, again, assuming the rankings stay the same, tell them they have to have a strategy for how to use the rankings, that they need to develop the criteria that are important to them. You know, try to encourage them to go beyond just looking at you know, the overall number. Ah, oh, they're number three. They must be great. Whereas maybe the criteria that are important to them, you know, that school is number 76. You know, so encourage your clients to do this, you know, to have a strategy and to look at the, the criteria, you know, not that final column, but the criteria that are important to them. Also, don't assume a halo effect between the rankings. Just because a school did very, very well in the MBA ranking does not necessarily mean it's going to do well in open and custom and vice versa. Accreditation is required by the FT, but you know, every, every company or every participant has to decide how accreditation is important to them. Is it important to them? Because remember, accreditation is given to the school for degree granting. It is not a part of executive education. Executive education is since grandfathered in if a school is accredited for its MBA program. And again, I would encourage you to say to your clients, to your participants, encourage them to share what they want with the FT. And as you can see here, we've got quite a few recommendations for the FT. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but again, just to highlight the, the main things, modernize the, the, the ranking. A lot has changed over the last 16 years, both in our industry and in our understanding of how to do ranking. So incorporate that. On the methodology, you know, there are quite a few things that you can do to improve the methodology to make it much more rigorous for the FT. And then on the transparency side as well. You know, a lot of us look up to and respect what the FT does. Uh, I certainly do, and so do my colleagues in the team. But at the same time, you know, when there's a lack of transparency, it raises a lot of questions. So some closing thoughts. What if? The big what if question. So what if the FT, clients, and business schools could all gather around together? I invite all of you to come to my house, sit in my sitting room, and we all sit around the table together and try to reimagine the rankings to reflect today's market. What kind of ideas do you think would bubble up? Some of the ones that came to us would be, you know, what if the rankings were open source? Yeah. This is the way the world's moving. Why not make the rankings open source? What if the rankings truly reflected quality in whatever way we define quality? What if the rankings reflected the richness and diversity of thought within this industry? And we are a diverse industry. And our clients are diverse. So how can we make it so the rankings reflect this and, and customers, participants are able to choose according to what makes sense to them? What if the rankings actually encouraged innovation instead of stifling it? And what if the rankings were truly a useful tool to find a program? You know, somebody who doesn't know what they, they're, they're, what, where to look, that they could go to the FT and find it easily and simply. And it reflects the criteria that they use for looking at quality. So I'll stop there, but even after we finish with the Q&A, I encourage you to, to go onto the Unicon website, look at the webinar that was done by Tom a couple of weeks ago, look at the uh, infographic that's up there on the website about how the rankings work. We've also put copies of all the ranking magazines from the FT since its inception on the website, and then the data is all up there as well. And I also encourage you to 
even if you're not going to read the entire report, look at the annotated bibliography that's at the end. Jenny did this, and it is a work of art. And it will really help you understand everything that's behind the ranking. So I will stop right there. Questions? Jim, thank you so much. And before we get into the questions, I do want to remind participants that the infographic um, is also available here on your on your toolbar. You'll see that there's a handout, and you can download um, the infographic that was available, as you mentioned, on the website and on the last webinar as well. Okay. But do we have any questions, Rob? Yes, it looks like we do have some coming in. Uh, one question. I understand the point about accreditation, but the AMBA and Equus processes both cover exec ed, and we were included in the documentation and meetings. Perhaps this needs to be made more evident. Uh, yeah, I mean, more evident, but, you know, is there actually, um, when you look at the accreditation, I mean, they're accrediting a school. They're not accrediting a particular program. And so, and so that's the issue, is when your customer looks at it and says, oh, you're accredited, do they understand that that's the school that's being accredited, or do they really believe that that says your AMP or whatever program is what's accredited? So it's really just a question of understanding what it is that's being qualified by that accreditation. I'm not saying that accreditation isn't important or isn't useful, but I think our clients need to understand what accreditation means. Jim, can I jump in on that? Sure. You, um so I'll put my webcam on too. So so I think it's also kind of a meta question, which is accreditation an important metric at all for executive ed? Because you know, one of the things that's actually to the business to the traditional business school's benefits for the Financial Times rankings is there are all sorts of organizations that are not included in the rankings that are really active working with uh, corporations in terms of leadership development. So it's not just the unaccredited schools, but it's all types of consulting and professional mm -hmm. organizations. And so accreditation really serves more as a screening tool than a quality metric in that mm -hmm. sense, because th these other organizations don't have it. So. It's it's an interesting metric for that reason. Um, it, it is to everyone's advantage, but it's not necessarily the quality metric. And from our surveys of customers, they didn't really know or care, <laughs> right? Right. but we care. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's helpful. Hey, Rob, next question. Yeah. Um, what evidence is there that rankings prevent innovation? Ah. <laughs> That's a good one. Well, this is something that you know probably you're not going to find on the front page of the FT, but we heard it in quite a few of the interviews of just saying, listen, why would I innovate? Because when you innovate, okay, you're trying something new and you don't know if it's going to work. Why would I take that risk with something that might fail? And then afterwards, that finds its way into the rankings as far as participants downgrading us. So that actually came out of uh, uh, just, uh, interviews with business schools and with experts. Yeah, I think you know it's there's there's a unfortunate push pull, and it's exactly what Jim said about you know our recommendation with the rankings as they are is you need to go out and optimize the stuff that the FT measures and let that be your ranking. But if that's not where you want to put your resources or your focus, then the schools are in this unfortunate position of having to put more resources into things that are less important to them than things they could be building for the future that are not part of the FT measurements. So there's definitely a disconnect. And, and we really got after the FT for the fact that they have left this ranking the same for so many years. I mean, they, they like this idea of comparable data. and they use it for, you know, a little, it's a little challenging how they use it. This bullwhip effect is real, and if you read the descriptions, there's always that paragraph of, and guess who moved the most, you know? <laughs> and so it, it, it could be more customer-centric and more customer-friendly focused, I think. Yeah. Great. We've got another question. Uh, we've heard that all not applicable responses responses on the survey are counted as zero in terms of the numerical analysis. Is this correct? Hmm. I don't know. That's the first time I've heard that. No idea. Uh, no idea. Uh, that's. I had not heard that and never came up in any of our other discussions. Um, I can't imagine they do that. That would be 
that that would be unfair. Yeah, but. yeah. It, it, I don't think I I okay. We have no data to back this up, but from our discussions with the FT, I'd be surprised if they did something that I would view as unprofessional. Yeah. Great, thank you. Another question, is it likely anyone other than FT will jump into the rankings business in the coming years, or will FT continue to own this market? You know, I, I haven't seen any evidence of it, but if the FT doesn't improve it, I can imagine somebody wanting to do it. And now, this proposes, poses perhaps a dilemma for the business schools, because what if somebody steps in and does it, and starts including the boutiques and consultants we are also working in our space and really provides a global ranking, not just a business school and second education ranking, then we could find ourselves in a little bit of trouble. Suddenly this wonderful pedestal that we've been placed on is we're just mixed in with all the boutiques of the world. That could be an issue. So I, I would not be surprised if somebody stepped in, especially given how relatively easy it could be to do given today's technology. But I, I can't imagine Della and her team giving it up easily. Yeah, I think I, I think that one of the things we would love to see happen is for the FT to move to something more like what the Princeton Review does for colleges, where they're just a bunch of different lists that are really much more focused on on um, individual needs. So regional programs specializing in leadership global programs specializing in innovation, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's, if you look at the Princeton Review site and what they have on colleges, if you haven't done that recently, you know, there's everything, but it's very, very personalized and, and just move away from this idea that there's a one to a hundred because, because it does get used and it's misleading. And, and, I, and I agree 100% with Jim, I think there's, there is a threat out there. Now, one thing that surprised me uh, is it's there's a huge amount of resources the FT puts into this and and Jim mentioned that business business week's not doing exact that anymore so that is a barrier for someone else doing it so there'd have to be money behind it for someone else to do it um, yeah. great we're getting a stream of questions along the line of um, have you shared your results with the FT and is there a real challenge or a real opportunity to work with FT to change the rankings from a crude scorecard to a helpful tool for individuals and organizations. Um, do you expect the FT will, will take up any recommendations that you make? I, I'm positively, I, I believe yes. I mean, throughout the process, I mean, we were on this project for almost a year. The FT, Ella and Laura were amazingly open with us. I never once felt like they were pushing back and telling us to stay out of their business. It was, it was actually the opposite. And we did share the results with, uh, with Della and Lowell before you know, publishing it. Um, they didn't come back and criticize anything we said. I mean, thanked us for it, thanked us for a couple of the comments on it. But you've got to remember, this all happened right at the moment that Nikai bought the FT. Mm -hmm. So we all know what it's like when one of our clients gets taken over. Uh, a lot of things get lost <laughs> during that time. So I don't expect Della to change anything immediately. Uh, you know, the next rankings will be coming out what, in February. I would, I'd be surprised if changes were made by then. And uh, honestly, that wouldn't be a good sign if they did, because that means they haven't collaborated with us to make the kind of changes that we think are, are needed. But, but let me say, too, that there might be a Unicon committee or a subset of Unicon schools with a high interest in this area that, not, you know, you can use this report now or some of the recommendations as a basis to reach out to the FT and think about how you can provide them with some resources and support and, you know, initiate that type of collaboration. I mean, don't just wait passively for them to fix everything and because, because I think one of the things, one of the key excitements about this 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 Unicon initiative was the, U the FT spends an enormous amount of time talking to individual schools. So Della estimates one day a week, one of five to 20% of their time is having one conversation and one conversation and one conversation and they don't have any way to have collective conversations with the schools either. So if you know if if the schools can think about 
here, we want you to test a new instrument or a new ranking and we'll support your, think, think about what you can do to help, you know, help them make some of the changes you'd like to see and approach them. Because, I mean, Jim had mo the most contact, but absolutely our impression was, was that they're very, they're very open to things that will support the industry. They care about the exec ed industry and Della is a leader in the industry and, and, and they're interested in doing things that move that forward, so. Great. And then a follow-up question. Do we know why uh, Business Week exited from the rankings? I don't think we, I, I, I think we tried to find out even going through some back channels, but never really understood why. So, you know, is it because they just decided the FT does a better job, let them have it? It's too much work? Um, I don't know why. Yeah, um, I don't think any, any insights? No? no, I don't think we found out. Mm -mm. And another question, Jim, I think you just touched on this, um, but does, let me see, uh, would you anticipate any changes to the methodology for the upcoming reporting cycle? If so, what will the changes be? And I think you just alluded to the fact that the timing for February is probably a little too quick. Yeah, and the change that we'd heard about is that they've been considering like one question or two questions on innovation we think the changes need to be much more fundamental than that and that's where I'm saying like you know if a group of schools that was sort of representative of the industry with different tiers and different backgrounds could get together and take this report and say here are the five things we really like and can we work with you FT to figure out how to build this into your process going forward try it I mean all they can say is no but that would be a really collaborative way to reach out to them right. Great. And we have another question. How does FT determine with which schools they will speak? They are open to speaking with everybody. So they do keep their own list and try to keep track of our industry as to who are the players. But they're also open to, you know, if somebody approaches them and says, hey, I'm the new, new kid on the block, and then I think I qualify for the ranking, you know, let me in. They will let you in. So if you're not in and you want to be, just tell them that you want to be part of it. And as long as you fulfill their criteria, which are published, we actually have them, I think, in our report, um, you can be in. Uh, yeah. that, that's up to us to, to push forward if we're not included. Yeah, one of the, one of the key ways to get included is to ask them. <laughs> Great. Any other questions from the audience at all? If, if so, now's your time to submit via the question panel. Give it just another minute here. Well, one of the things I'll add while we're waiting for questions, and, and I heard this from quite a few people now who have read the report, is that if you've got somebody new in your organization who hasn't been in executive education before, even if they come from the MBA side, give them this report to do to try and understand our industry. Not just because they need to understand how the rankings work, but the drivers of our industry are reflected in the things we like and dislike about the FT rankings. So if they read this, you have a much better understanding of our ranking. You know, even one of the members of the, the research committee from Unicon said, I wish I'd had this when I joined the industry. It would have made life so much easier for me. I might not have liked everything I saw, but I would have understood it better. So this report can be used for that as well. It's a primer for somebody entering the industry. Excellent. And I'm, I'm not seeing any additional questions, so I think that will probably um, wrap up our program for today. Jim, I'd like to thank you very much for delivering a very insightful um, presentation this morning. Jenny, also wonderful to have your participation, especially in the Q&A. And just lastly, a quick note of thanks to both of you, as well as Tom, for all your hard work in, in uh, gathering your information and, and compiling this research and giving us this great report that we have to work with. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this webinar and uh, all the supporting materials from both this webinar, the research paper, and the past webinar will all be available on the Unicon website. So I encourage members to access that information uh, and, and really use this to help kind of guide your actions in, in your work. Um, with that, again, thank you both Jim and Jenny. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you, and we hope that everybody enjoyed today's session. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody.